Jason calls in from Google I.O. Uber will not sell me a flying car anytime soon. Spell checkers might be making us stupid and hackers are not going to destroy the world yet. All that and more coming up on Tech News Weekly. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Weekly is brought to you by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Weekly, episode 31, recorded Thursday, May 10th, 2018. This episode of Tech News Weekly is brought to you by LinkedIn Marketing Solutions. Drive brand awareness, generate leads, and build long-term purposeful relationships with LinkedIn Marketing Solutions. To redeem a free $100 LinkedIn ad credit, visit linkedin.com slash TNW. Welcome to Tech News Weekly. This is a show where every week we talk about all the news that happened with the newsmakers and the newsbreakers. This week, Jason was a newsbreaker. I'm Megan Maroney. I'm Jason Howell from Google I.O. in Mountain View, California, not too far away from Petaluma. Although it's windy out here, so I apologize about the, the wind-whipped hair that I've got going on right it's now. It's lovely. It's just, you look, Thanks. I mean, I now it's the only the only by your wind-whipped hair can I tell that you're actually a real person and not some sort of Google bot with all the ums true. and all the nonsense. You are real, right? Uh, yeah, um, but um, <laughs> it's possible that someday they'll have that figured out too, Megan. Anything um, possible at this point. <laughs> well... <laughs> So, okay, uh, sentient robot voices, cloud APIs, we've got, we've got it all um, this week. Sure. And what, uh, so, so tell us about the most exciting things to you, Jason Howell. Okay, I know we're going to talk about duplex in a minute, so I'm not going to start with that, although everybody's talking about it, but we'll, we'll save that for a second. I put together a, just a small list of three nerdy things that I've really enjoyed since I've been here. So I'll just go through them real quick. Um, the first thing, if you saw the keynote and you saw it was actually towards the very beginning of the keynote, they showed the YouTube video of the two commentators talking all over each other and how they're, they're using their algorithms to be able to split the audio apart from each side. Even though there aren't two distinct channels, that's all one channel, but their their systems are able to pull each person's voice out of the feed and then transcribe each side uh, independent of the other. For, from an audio nerd standpoint, that totally blew me away, and I'm, I'm really excited to see what that leads to. I love what they're doing in that in that um, area. Um, but to kind of like dial into things that people will actually get their hands on and stuff, I'm really interested in uh, what Google's doing right now on the Android side of things on componentizing the OS. And what do I mean by that? Things like app actions, which they showed off, that's like skills or shortcuts uh, to functions of apps that can be found in places like the Assistant, Play Store, Home Screen. Maybe eventually third-party apps will will get these uh, app actions inside of them. I asked about that. They said that's possible on the horizon. Also, slices, which is where apps are sharing pieces of functionality across the platform, which kind of sounds similar to the same thing, but you would see this embedded in search to begin with. So say you search for uh, Hawaii, and then down in the search results, you'd also see a little a little slice of the Photos app with your pictures from Hawaii kind of embedded in there. Uh, and then things like app bundles, which is also along this idea, this line of componentizing uh, the OS. And that's basically a way for developers to only deliver pieces of their app to phones that actually matter on that device. So if a device has a certain configuration, it doesn't need, you know, like 20 languages uh, to be downloaded uh, you know, you're, you're speaking and using one language. Why waste all the space on your device uh, by downloading all of those languages into uh, one place when all you really needed was one? So it's really cool how they're kind of splitting things apart. And um, I don't know, I, I like that approach. It feels similar. I don't know if you remember last year, they talked about Project Treble, which was the idea of like splitting the OS apart from the, the vendor uh, part of the OS so that the hardware can kind of operate and be updated 
on a different path than straight up Android OS. And really seems like this is an extension of that. They're going deeper and deeper every year. Okay, so the internet is basically has lost its mind over the duplex, which we talked about. We talked about earlier. That's those voices that sort of um, <laughs> sound like a real voice, but they're all AI, and they'll call up and make reservations for you. And and basically, there's one camp of the internet that says that's really um, scary and dangerous, and you're fooling people. And the other camp is saying, like, get over it. We just want a bot to be able to um, cancel our credit card. Um, or you know, cable bill. What are what are your thoughts, and what what are the thoughts of the people on the ground there that have actually that were actually there listening to this um, demo? <laughs> well, I I feel like this particular part of the keynote, anyways, was the Sergey Brin skydiving out of an airplane into the top of the building of Google I/O from years ago. That's basically what this was. It was meant to get people talking. I don't know if maybe it was a little tone deaf. Um, no pun intended. Um, for, you know, for the sign of the times, right? Like we're kind of getting a little bit more skeptical about what AI, what the, what the extension of AI will be as we go further. And, you know, kind of deceiving people <laughs> doesn't play very well in tech press, I don't think. So I think what you're talking about is very representative of what I've been hearing around here. People are either on one side firmly or the other. Personally, I feel like if you're like, I would, I would not want to use this. I like, I get it. We don't like talking on the phone to other people, but I don't feel like that's the pain point. The pain point for me is not talking to someone else. And if I can avoid deceiving them in the process, great. My pain point is phone trees and waiting to talk to someone. So if I can sick my Google Assistant to be like, you know what, I need to talk to PG&E. It's going to take 20 minutes. I know it. You go work on that and you give me a call when you know you have a human. And then maybe they hear something like, you know, Google Assistant is calling for Jason. Please hold. He's joining the line. You know, I feel like that's kind of best of both worlds. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I mean, I have a bot that I use called TrimBot. I, I think I've told you about it. And it's, it never calls anyone, but it does um, send emails on my behalf to try to cancel subscriptions. And, you know, it does sort those sorts of things like that, um, you know, because we're, we're getting used to that. Like on Twitter, we're not necessarily sure if we're talking to a bot or not. Even those little, you know, chat boxes, we're not, we're never sure. And you know, and it, it's but it's really getting into that uncanny valley that I think I'm not surprised that people are uncomfortable about it. Yeah, and I think um, if if it had been any less convincing, people wouldn't be nearly as worked up about it. But that's the thing. That's what's so interesting about it is that it was super convincing. They added the artificial ums in there, which almost felt like just the, that little extra depth. Like they maybe they didn't even need to add ums in there because when you really listen to the audio, sometimes those ums feel like they were, like now that you know that it's artificial, it feels like it was purposefully placed in exactly that point. I don't know how deep they went with it, but I don't know. Uh, it's it, it's interesting. It's definitely one of those, wow, we're definitely living in the future. It's cool that they can do it. I just would feel really weird doing that specifically myself. So what about the gestures? They look suspiciously like iPhone 10 gestures. Have you, I know <laughs> you've downloaded the, um, the the beta, right? So you, you've, yeah. you've tried out some of these new gestures. Yes, absolutely. I'm, I I almost immediately upgraded my my only phone here to the latest version, and I have to say the new version is not quite as stable as the first version was of the uh, of the developer preview. But anyways, as far as the gestures are concerned, um, Dave Burke, uh, who was on stage to announce this, he made sure to point out that we've been working on this for a long time, which I think was his subtle in, in, in you know inference that this was not a reaction to iPhone. So take take that for what it's worth. I know that in my time using the iOS, uh, using the iPhone when we traded this last time, the gestures felt absolutely uh, seamless. Like it, it really did improve, improve navigation on the phone. It simplified things. It was easy to understand. I really, it was one of my takeaways from that phone is that I really enjoyed how they implemented gestures. At this stage, in my experience with this developer preview, I do not feel that way. Now, Mind you, you have to understand that this is a developer preview, right? This is not meant uh, for mainstream yet. There will be tweaks. I have no doubt that they're going to tailor this a little bit further and clean things up. But right now, it's it's just it's confusing. I know that their their goal in introducing this, um, and we spoke with Alan Wong, who actually worked on this particular feature on uh, All About Android, uh, which posted yesterday. 
and he he made sure to stress that their goal with this version was to simplify things that android in many ways can be overly complicated and they want to kind of simplify things to make it easier for anyone to hop in there and uh, know how to control it and all that kind of stuff at this stage i don't feel like these gestures do that and i've been living with them now almost three days and i still get confused there's just too many things that kind of seem to overlap a little bit Maybe in a week I'll be like, oh, yeah, totally. It's it was not a problem. But right now I feel like there's work to be done. It will not surprise you that my favorite announcement was the digital well-being announcements because um, the person I need to save myself from is always myself, the, myself at yeah. 10 p.m. scrolling through Twitter when I should be sleeping. There's been a lot of disagreement about this, too. I know Jeff Jarvis on on Twig was like, you know, we're, we're all adults. Why do we need that? But I need that. What did you think? Um, we are all adults. Uh, why do some people need it? They don't. Some people, though, I would do. appreciate it. That's how I feel. I feel I feel like, you know what, if, if you have the ability to add in controls that are going to help some people, like this isn't meant for everybody. Not everybody needs help doing this, but some people would appreciate the ability to do it. And if you're going to build in these features and they're actually useful, then why not? The dashboard app is a separate app. Uh, you don't need to use it to track your app usage. It tracks, you know, your time spent in things, sets limits. If you're aware that using your phone is not making you happy, this is a way that you can kind of analyze your usage and maybe make changes. Maybe that having that data actually allows you to make that decision. Um, some of the other things that they included in there, I think, are infinitely useful to me. Shush, which is the feature where if you set your phone down, display. Uh, facing down, it will automatically activate the do not disturb mode, which kind of silences a number of features on your phone. Like I already do that when I'm at dinner and I don't want to be bugged by the notifications that are flashing on my screen. I put my phone face down and I just feel like it's it's a way it's like a symbol for for myself saying I'm not caring about that right now. I'm caring about you. And I, I feel like in winding down where it turns the the display black and white at a certain time that you choose. So like you don't want to use your phone after 10 p.m., have the wind down happen then and then it grayscales it and that annoys you to not use your phone. It's your visible symbol. I mean, I, I don't understand why not. It's not it's not hurting anybody. If you if you feel like you need it, there you go. There's an extra tool for you. I would like it. Uh, so what about my self-driving car? Did you hear any news about <laughs> from Waymo? I mean, you know what? They had they had their little announcement, their time on stage uh, during the keynote. I've really heard little to nothing about it other than that. A handful of reporters have been able to go out and you know take a ride in Waymo. But from what I understand, even when they're out there, nobody's answering any any really tough questions about Waymo. That that whole presentation on the keynote really felt to me like like they were giving Waymo just a, a little bit of a, a bone. You know what I mean? Okay, cool. We'll put you on stage. You can make sure that everybody remembers, you know, that Waymo exists and that you're doing interesting things. And by the way, they had that accident a week ago, which it turns out was not the fault of the car. It was in manual mode at the point of the collision, but it got a lot of news. And I think this was a way of kind of like pulling people away from that and saying, hey, Waymo now knows how to drive through snow. Isn't that cool that we figured that out too? And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's good, uh, good publicity for Waymo when it needed it. All right. So what else? I know you guys, you did a great all about Android. Um, you had some of the same developers that you had on last year. I, I always love those discussions. They're really fascinating to get to talk to the people that worked on all of these projects. What else? Anything else that, that we need to know about that I missed? Um, you know, it's not really. I mean, that that, that interview, by the way, we had a, a blast. It was Jeff Jarvis, Florence Ion, and myself. We were talking with Stephanie uh, uh, Cuthbertson of the Android team and then Alan Wong of the Android team. We really cover the bases in that interview. So if you want to kind of get a sense of, of some of the Android-specific news, you can dive into there. Um, I was looking forward to, to hearing some, uh, yeah, there it is. I was looking forward to hearing some announcements around Android TV, Android Auto, and really my, my general sense here and of many other people is that, you know, Google is really just making sure you know what Assistant is. You know, hey, we've got Assistant in all the places. And it's kind of like, okay, we knew what Assistant was. So that's that's neat that you like it as much as you do. But hey, it's useful, so we understand. But Android TV did get an update with uh, some new hardware. I don't know if you heard about the JBL har uh, Link Bar, but it's like a, sa a new sound bar. It has Assistant built into it. And there's actually a little bit of news in there aside from the fact that it's a link bar with Assistant, and that's that with multiple HDMI ports, 
It's the first Android TV device to have an active overlay support. Basically, what that means is that Assistant is running on top of all the other things that you do inside the box. So if you you know, want to use Assistant to switch you know, from one HDMI port to the other, you can do that. If you want to pull up Assistant because you're on your cable box watching a show and that act, you know, Burt Reynolds comes on the screen and you're like, who's Burt Reynolds? There's somebody out there that doesn't know who Burt Reynolds is. Uh, you can ask Assistant and it can kind of contextualize the entire, you know, all of the devices that are plugged into it. It's the first device to do that. So I think that's pretty cool. It is. Well, thank yeah. you for thank you for spending all this time there. Thank you for calling in. Um, and of course, you'll be back uh, yes. on next week, and you'll be back for all about Android first. And we'll, well, are you you're not on any shows this weekend, right? No, I've got a, a short that I'm going to do a little a little roundup of some of the weird, kooky, neat things that you find in the sandboxes around uh, Google I/O. Sandboxes are like these big tents, you know, like this one's on Android experiments, this one's on AI, whatever. And you're always guaranteed to find really cool things that you can play with. I'm going to do a collection of that. That'll be on this week's uh, this weekend's new screensavers. Awesome. Well, um, drive safely home. Thank you, Megan. All right, Have a good care. rest of your show. <laughs> Bye, -bye. Hi, everyone. Google I.O., Google Schmai Schmo, that's what I say. Can we talk about flying cars now? Eric Newcomer from Bloomberg spent this week at Uber's Elevate conference, and he's joining us to talk about it. Welcome back to the show, Eric. Hey, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. So you write that Uber isn't creating its own flying cars per se, but they're releasing the design plans. Tell us what that means. Yeah, so they, they have five hardware partners that they're working with. Uber is just, you know sort of setting up the requirements saying, you know, we want these to work in cities. Uh, they're bringing a bunch of partners together. So, you know, might have a battery manufacturer They had a bunch of architecture firms present on the types of landing pads these uh, vehicles could have. So it's sort of bringing in all the pieces together because Uber wants to provide, you know, someday far in the future, you know, the ride hailing equivalent uh, for the skies. So this is ride hailing specifically. It's not, no one's going to be able to buy an uh, Uber flying car anytime soon. Right. Definitely. Well, nobody's going to be able to do either anytime soon, but <laughs> okay. the model, whenever it does happen, you know, Uber hopes for commercialization, you know, at least on a small scale in 2023. The idea there would be, you know, you go to some sort of small scale airport, get in, you know, one of these flying cars and it takes you across town. But certainly, yeah, you would not own that car or flying car. And so, yeah, people make fun of calling it flying car. Either you or Brad no. Stone in one of your interviews, uh, the person you were talking to said, you know, we, we used to call cars carriageless or horseless carriages. So it's sort no. of like what it, we're talking about, what it's not. It probably will have some other name when it's coming. Is anybody talking about autonomous um, flying, whatever they are? Yes. Yeah, there's this company, Aurora, that uh, Boeing bought that's, sort of fixated on that issue. Um, Uber itself, I think, has sort of understated how much it thinks autonomous is important to this. I mean, especially as you have all these vehicles close to each other, I think there's going to be sort of a significant autonomous component. And really making sort of the financial equation work is going to require autonomous over time. But I think, you know, in the beginning, the plan is a driver with four passengers and then eventually sort of hand more and more of the responsibility over uh, to the autonomous technology. But yeah, that's really at the forefront here. And you also wrote about a, a pact that they, a research pact that they, Uber has with NASA. What can you tell us about that? Yeah, it's sort of looking at the air traffic control sort of aspects in a Dallas-Fort Worth area. And I mean, I think it's exciting. They're gonna share some data and it's exciting just to see sort of NASA invested in sort of looking at what happens if you have sort of human passengers, piloted vehicles traveling, uh, you know, near an airport and how would that actually work in sort of an urban area? So it's sort of a research project to start answering the question of how, you know, the, uh, this service could sort of get integrated into the existing uh, sort of world where we have airplanes and helicopters obviously are still going to be flying around. So so how much discussion was there of safety? I mean, this was this is an annual conference. Um, I know there was one last year at least. So uh, yeah. this is kind of a different story this year in terms of, you know, because we've had fatal accidents yeah, in the past year. The, the Uber fatality was certainly sort of in the back of everybody's mind. And 
came up, uh, you know, after the federal uh, aviation, uh, the FAA sort of administrator spoke um, and safety <laughs> seemed to be every other word, you know, and that's certainly their mandate. And they're the ones that are going to have to regulate this down the road. And uh, Dan Elwell, as well, the uh, administrator spoke afterwards and, uh, you know, said that, you know, definitely acknowledged that that accident was tragic and said, you know, given how people worried people are about air travel, they'd be even sort of more worried than they were about sort of an on the ground accident because we have way more accidents in cars than we do have than we have an airplane. So the standards for safety in the sky are just so much higher. And he emphasized that, you know, uh, the FAA isn't willing to abandon sort of those tight safety standards. And so uh, this year was different, obviously, as well, because they have a new CEO, uh, Dara Khosrowshahi. And uh, I know Brad Stone from Bloomberg spoke to him. Um, was there a sense that, that, that the whole company has sort of changed? Um, I know the accident has happened since then. And Brad asked him, you know, some people are saying that they that maybe things have been sped up because they're trying to people are trying to impress you. Um, what, what is the overall um, feeling of Uber under Khosrowshahi? Well, it's funny. I think when Dara came in, there were a lot of fears that, you know, he'd shut down Elevate, he'd abandon sort of all these peripheral projects. And I think he's sort of he's he sort of admittedly admitted uh, that he's sort of come to this realization that Uber is sort of a growth company that sort of changes how the world thinks about transportation. And so he's I, doubling down, it seems, on self-driving cars uh, and now flying cars. So while I think there was initial apprehension, uh, to some extent, it's sort of business as usual for Uber in terms of uh, continuing the course. Um, obviously, he's sort of had a friendlier relationship with governments, which is super useful uh, for Uber. And I think, you know, his personal touch has helped the company. But that's, I mean, been the stated strategy of the company for a while. You know, they've been trying uh, to get along. So I, I don't know how radical it's been. If anything, I think he came in and was convinced that Uber can't just cut costs and be, you know, the $100 billion company that it wants to be. It needs this sort of global futuristic vision. And so I think he's he's sticking to that. And so they, they also announced that they were going to start delivering food uh, with drones. What, um, <laughs> how's that going to work? Well, I think that's really early. Um, it was interesting for a couple of reasons. So the Department of Transportation sort of allowed 10 different governments to apply with companies to test out drones. And Uber is part of San Diego's application to try out food delivery. So Dara talked a little bit about that. And so that is interesting for its own sake, the idea that they might try sort of food delivery via drone. And Uber Eats is super important to Uber now. It's more than 10% of Uber's uh, gross bookings. Dara said they had the largest uh, food delivery business in the world. And so they're you know, trying to think about how to expand food delivery. And then in light of Uber Elevate, the fact that the federal government is saying, okay, we're gonna carve out ways to experiment with drones shows that at least under the Trump administration, there's a lot of willingness to sort of change the rules to allow for experimentation with new technologies. So you could see a similar path for manned aircraft um, in a couple of years. Well, I know food by drone is one of those things that people like to make fun of as in Ready Player One. It's right. like, oh, really? Like that's, you know, we've created this amazing technology and we're going to use it to get pizza faster. Right. Um, and then Zipline, the drone company Zipline made news because they were delivering blood to places and it, you know, it was sort of, uh, oh, okay, you know, this makes sense. Maybe we really are going to change the world. Was Uber talking right. about anything like that? Uh, not that I've heard about. I mean, yeah, certainly some of the drone delivery sort of in uh, the developing world has been one of the more compelling drone use cases. But uh, from Uber, uh, really, I haven't heard them talk a ton of, about drones before this Uber Eats experiment. So, no, I think uh, they're sort of stuck in, you know, what we might think of as sort of a trivial use case, but I mean, everybody's eating. And so just trying to get uh, food to people quickly.
Everybody's eating and everyone's getting drunk and needing to Uber home. So. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> That's the way to yeah, change the world. world in some cases, but yeah. <laughs> well, Eric, thank you so much for taking the time to join us. Eric Newcomer is a reporter at Bloomberg. And where's the best place for pe people to follow all your work online? Oh, you know, Eric Newcomer on Twitter is fine. That's a great place to find me. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. After the break, I will investigate the seamy underbelly of the world of spell checkers. But first, this episode of Tech News Weekly is brought to you by LinkedIn Marketing Solutions. When it comes to marketing your business, it's all about connecting with the right audience when your message will resonate the most. If you want to target your customers where they are every day and when they're ready to make a decision, LinkedIn can help. When you advertise on LinkedIn, the world's largest professional network, you have the opportunity to build some long-term relationships with your customers, relationships that can translate into high-quality leads, website traffic, and higher brand awareness. The first step is always talking to the right people, finding the right audience. Every day, over 500 million professionals engage with content on LinkedIn, and there's a pretty good chance that your future customers are there among them. LinkedIn has the marketing tools to help you target your customers with precision down to their job, their title, their company name, and their industry. And better targeting equals a message your customers care about, which in turn leads to more trust built with your customers. Four to five customers on LinkedIn are decision makers at their company. So you're building relationships that really matter. You're talking to the people that you need to be talking to. So promote your business with LinkedIn Marketing Solutions. And you can redeem a free $100 LinkedIn ad credit. All you have to do is go to linkedin.com slash TNW. Don't forget the TNW at the end. That's how they know we sent you to them. LinkedIn.com slash TNW for your free $100 ad credit. Terms and conditions apply. And of course, we thank LinkedIn Marketing Solutions for their support. If you've ever experienced that special kind of technological exasperation of having Google spell check tell you that a word is spelled wrong when you know that it is not, you're going to want to stick around and find out why. Paris Martineau from The Outline says that unless you're a nerd, you probably don't spend much time thinking about spell checkers. We are all nerds here. So welcome to the show, Paris. Thanks for having me, Megan. Glad to be around some fellow nerds. <laughs> yes, always. So you write that when Google spell checker tries to correct going to gonna, like G-O-I-N-G to G-O-N-N-A. Mm -hmm. It's not that it's wrong, it's that it's too right. <laughs> Explain what you yeah. mean by that. Yeah, so actually, um, yeah, Google is actually being smarter than us when it's uh, making these stupid mistakes. So, I mean, I guess to get into the details of this, spell checkers work generally by um, one of two ways. It's called either like isolated word correction, which is where you're like, is this a word? Is it not a word? That's pretty simple. But the uh, more complicated version is called context-dependent word correction, where it looks at your whole sentence and tries to figure out, is this the right real word you meant to put there? And so normally, uh, spell checkers will look at a dictionary or some large corpus of examples of correct sentences and phrases and compare your sentence or words against those to try and figure out how likely it is that you're getting it wrong or right. But the thing is, Google, well, they're Google, so they have access to basically the entire internet. And back in 2012, they updated their spell checker so that the body of examples that it was drawing from was basically the entire web. Um, it paired it up with its Google bot. So every website they were able to basically access through Google um, that's part of its whole corpus of examples. And so this is great on the reason that... Um, the dictionary basically it evolves with the internet, but it's also kind of awful because the dictionary evolves with the internet, which um, has its ups and downs. So occasionally if you're using a less common spelling or pronunciation, uh, the web or all the uh, words and phrasings that Google will see as trends in the web can sometimes overpower that even if it's correct and slip through um, Google safeguards and you'll accidentally get a slang spelling suggested as the correct spelling because it's seen more often online. Mm -hmm. Like if I'm going to say that someone's eyebrows are on fleek, it's not going to, you know, it's going to get that. At this point, that was, yeah, yeah it's, it'll know that because it's been around for a while. Yeah. So, I mean, it's got its uh, pluses in where you'll have a word like fleek that'll be in there, 
right as it's coming uh, like up as a trend. But then also if you're using some fancy phrasing or an archaic verb, it might not get it all the time because it sees that as less probable than you saying the more common version of it that you'd see online. So I know you reached out to Google to see uh, if they had um, any, you know, way they were defending this or whether uh, it was making Yeah, stupid. so I, I, I reached out. They haven't responded yet, but I honestly didn't really expect them to. Google is, well, Google, and they're very secretive about everything, especially anything that comes vaguely in the realm of their search results or um, magic that goes on behind the scenes. Um, but the things I talked to quite a few different researchers that work on uh, online spell check systems or these sort of uh, word correction systems. And they all said that this is by far the most likely reason or the only reason they could think of as this happening unless Google is has somehow designed a whole different version of spell checker or spell correcting algorithms that is vastly different than anything else out there on the market. I mean, we're used to auto correct, like, or, you know, auto fill mm -hmm. or all that stuff, you know, and it's just like, well, that's not what I meant. Um, and we usually notice when it's not what we meant, not when we, we don't usually notice when it is what we meant because, you know, we just continue on typing quickly. But is it, I mean, is Apple, is Microsoft, are they using um, their data set as well? I mean, I would assume so. But the thing is, Google just has access to so much more data and so much more, I don't know, raw human typing than any other company, I'd think. Everybody's always typing something into Google search as well as I'm sure they have they have access to everything you do on Gmail, Google Docs, all these different things. I'm not sure which parts of it they feed into the system because they've only explicitly mentioned um, Google Bot, which crawls all web pages in the web. Mm -hmm. But um. That's kind of a hard, that's kind of a hard sum of pages to beat the entire internet. Well, I want to keep talking about Google. The outline had a great tweet about this morning about how if you're tired of listening to another dude talk about Google I.O., then uh, listen to this podcast. <laughs> we just had a dude talking about Google I.O., but he's a good dude. Um, but yeah, no, they mostly are, but also... Mm. But so you guys had their three three women talking about your experiences. I think you just listening, and I, I love listening to this podcast, especially because it described you screaming into Slack, which I'd never heard that that, that could be done <laughs> during. Oh God, what were, my embarrassing. <laughs> what were your, uh, what was your overall feel about the uh, the news from Google I.O.? Um, yeah, well, I've, as you mentioned, Casey uh, Johnston, my editor at the Future section mentioned that during Google I.O., I was kind of blowing up our Slack channel, getting excited, you know, they had a lot of interesting uh, product reveals, or I don't even say product, idea reveals. Um, such as, I mean, Google Lens is something that is actually planning on coming out in the next couple of weeks, which is in itself, it seems if everything goes according to plan to be very interesting and cool. They have a lot of, um, or you can essentially point your camera at text and it will be able to copy and paste the text from the real world to your phone or search from that text and so on. Um, but the thing is why I was mostly screaming this into Slack and not on the Twitter or writing a vlog about it is it's very hard to, or at least I find it very hard to be genuinely excited about these sort of uh, conferences or keynotes because everything is designed to be as perfect and spectacular as possible when often the reality is this product won't come out for years or this product probably isn't going to work the first couple of six months. So it's, oh, I always try and, uh, take all of my PR conferences with a bit of a grain of salt. <laughs> and you also had another piece on the outline about um, Facebook mm -hmm. finally doing something right. So, you know, tell us about that. They, uh, I guess their fake news algorithm is working now. Yeah. So uh, on the outline since um, on January 12th, Facebook announced a change to their news feed, which really upset the whole publishing online media publishing world. Essentially, they said that they were going to start deprioritizing news publishers in the news feed and instead uh, try and focus on time well spent or human engagements or whatever. Uh, and so, of course, everybody started losing their marbles over this as most publishers get most of their traffic from Facebook nowadays. Um, and back in early March, we in the outline 
did a comparison of the traffic of a lot of different outlets over the first month or two. And we, like a lot of other outlets who reported on this, found that there was a significant drop off. But now it's been four or so months later and we decided to do another analysis of the whole four month period using engagement or interaction data we got from CrowdTangle. And what we found was actually quite interesting in the fact that these changes don't seem to have affected most of the mainstream news publishers at all, really. I mean, some outlets like us in March had seen a dip in February, but that was just a normal dip in traffic that publishers occasionally experience from month to month. But when you look at the data of like interactions, which is measured by taking comments and likes and shares on posts, it seemed like major news outlets like CNN, Fox, Washington Post, New York Times, and so on, they weren't really affected by this algorithm switch at all. Instead, it seemed to be predominantly or solely affecting the sort of inflammatory fake news conspiracy spreading outlets like um, Gateway Pundit, which dropped, I think, like 69%, if I'm remembering correctly, and Breitbart, and uh, other ones that are just uh, the ones that you think of when you think of polarizing Facebook content, which was surprising because that seemed to be exactly what Facebook designed to do. So point to Facebook for the first time in a while. <laughs> yeah, or I mean, maybe just the fact that everyone was saying it every day and, you know, Mark Zuckerberg was on the news and saying really like, you know, <laughs> this, this some of these, these stories you're reading might not be true, even though they look like the rest of the news outlets. That's probably the uh, the truth of it. <laughs> I mean, yeah, there's just been so much going on lately in the past four months when it comes to um, all of this hubaloo in the tech sphere that it could be one of hundreds of factors and we'll never really be able to know and isolate it. But yeah, it's good news. It's good to hear good news. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's one of those things that I was writing it and I was like, wow, when's the last time I wrote non-negative news about Facebook? I'm not sure, but here we are. Well, Paris, thank you so much for joining us. Paris Martineau, Martineau is a staff writer at The Outline. Um, she has, I love your beat. Your pieces are great. She also has a piece on the intellectual dark web, which I will not touch because it is making a lot of people really angry on Twitter. Oh, I yeah. But I mean, if you, uh, if any of your listeners want to uh, read it, outline.com, as well as we've got a lot of other good coverage on these topics on our daily podcast, The Outline World Dispatch, which is available wherever you listen to podcasts. Okay, yes, and I listen to it on the on my Amazon Echo when it's part of the little, you know. Oh yeah, we're, we're in all of your devices. We can be in, <laughs> we can, we're basically in your home now. <laughs> we're everywhere. <laughs> yes, definitely read the intellectual dark web um, story. Mm -hmm. It is really fascinating. And you know, when you stir the pot like that, you know you've done something right, I think. Yeah, I can always tell um, when something I've written is good based on the number of uh, hate emails or hate DMs I get. So <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Keep fighting the good fight. But she is also at Paris Martineau on Twitter. Say something nice. So, you know. Yeah. Yes. yeah. Try and correct the flow for me. Thank you. Guys. <laughs> right, take care. You too. Thank you. Well, last week we heard that Twitter had left all our passwords vulnerable by allowing access to them from someone at Twitter. While this was vaguely concerning, our next guest is working for a company that's ensuring cybersecurity at a somewhat higher level. For example, our civilian critical infrastructure. Welcome back to the show, Selena Larson. Hey, thanks so much for having me. I'm glad to be here. So when we last spoke, you were writing for CNN. Now you were working for a company called Dragos that bills itself as a firm that hunts malware that can kill, which <laughs> sounds scary, like a sci-fi movie. Uh, what exactly are we talking about here? Yeah, so we can get to the malware that can kill part in a little bit. Okay. Um, but, <laughs> but yeah, so um, I'm still writing, just FYI. I'm no longer a journalist, but I am a technical writer at Dragos. Um, I'm part of the threat intelligence team, uh, so I'm still writing all the time, threat reports, security advisories, uh, things like that, but so a different type. Um, and what Dragos is, uh, so we're an ICS security company. Um, if you're not familiar with, with what that means, it's industrial control system. So everything from the electric grid to oil and gas, uh, chemical manufacturing, uh, even things like breweries. Uh, basically, we exist to sort of safeguard and protect those systems. Um, and so what we do is we take uh, human intelligence and couple that with threat behavior analytics, uh, essentially hacker tradecraft, and we put that into our products. Um, so we have the Dragos platform, which is software for detecting and responding to ICS threats. 
that so um, companies can have visibility if they see some like weird behaviors on these two machines shouldn't be talking to each other. So let's go see what that is. Um, and then we have uh, our threat operations center, which is um, provides, you know, like threat hunting, incident response services. Um, and we do ICS cybersecurity training. So um if you're like in IT and you're like, oh, I want to pivot into ICS uh, security, what's that all about? Um, we have uh, classes that you can take, and I'm actually taking one at the end of the month. So that should be fun. Well, <laughs> um, I know <laughs> ahead, from yeah. your Twitter that you, I know that you've been, you know, you were covering cybersecurity and getting more and more interested in it. Was it the decision to leave journalism or were you just like really so interested in cybersecurity that you wanted to do it full time? So um, one of the things, you know, I, I love journalism, obviously, don't get me wrong. Um, but as I was sort of investigating and, and doing all of this reporting, um, I had heard about Dragos, obviously, and knew what they were up to. Um, and so I was really interested in this sort of idea of um, protecting infrastructure. Um, and I think it's something that's like a little bit misunderstood sometimes. So you have these like big ideas of like what could potentially happen, um, like rolling blackouts across the United States, like partook by a hacker, you know, behind the screens wearing a fedora. Um, and so for me, you know, um, kind of like combating that, that sort of stereotype and learning more about that, and educating people, um, and, you know, being able to, to, to be a part of this really exciting industry, um, was what sort of drew me into that, into that area. And so getting to the, um, to the malware that can kill us, does that have anything to do with the brewery that you do cybersecurity for? <laughs> no, no. Because okay. so, yeah. if they, you know, if the brewery goes down, bad things happen. Yeah, no. Um, <laughs> maybe I'll write that in one of my fiction stories. Okay. You know, that potential. <laughs> um, but no. So, um, so one of the things that we discovered last year was something called Trisis. Um, and this is ICS malware that targeted safety systems, um, which are literally things that are put in place to protect human life. Um, and so this was kind of a shift from what we've seen historically. You know, um, like previously, you see one to two activity groups targeting um, industrial control systems every year. And in 2017, we saw five. Um, so this was one of the big ones. And um, it was a shift because the attack either specifically targeted or accepted um, a loss of human life could be a result of the attack. Like th that that was like a consequence that would have been like, OK, um, but, you know, that's why we're here. Right. So to find those adversaries, to find those behaviors and help people better defend ICS environments. So who are these people that want to kill us with malware? Is it, I mean, Russia or is it like, you know, my neighbor? <laughs> Who's I doing this? I hope it's not your neighbor. Um, <laughs> Uh, no, so uh, so actually, Dragos, we track something. Uh, we track these by um, threat threat groups, activity groups. Um, we don't actually do attribution. Um, so what we do is we track um, seven different types of activity groups. Um, and we actually uh, this week we launched the month of ICS threats. Um, so you know people can kind of take a look, visit our website, and and learn throughout the month um, the tools, techniques, and procedures that these um, adversaries use to target these critical systems. Um, so we don't actually. Um, say it was Russia, it was Iran or whatever. Um, so we like to go after these activity groups based on their behaviors as opposed to um, like a nation state affiliation and things like that. Um, so that's, you know, the information that we provide to people is like, here's the behavior that you should be looking out for. Here is um, the activity that they're doing. Not necessarily here is the person or persons uh, behind it. It's probably not my neighbor. He's super nice. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know why I brought him up. So I know at RSA, uh, you, uh, Dragos had a whole IoT home device um, display. So what, what for me, like I've been smartening up my house. I have the, my coffee maker can go off automatically and tells me when my coffee is ready. I've got lights that, you know, go off and on. How, I mean, how dangerous are these like um, IoT devices that we're all filling our homes with? Yeah, so um, those, uh, pretty much any time you add something connected to the internet, to your home or work or whatever, um, you're adding in a, a, another potential like vector for like attack vector that somebody could get on and be like, get to the rest of your, your network, right? Um, so there's always that risk. There's always that possibility. Um, we have our phones, we have our computers, and now we have our dishwashers and everything else. Um, but what we actually demonstrated um, at the uh, ICS Village was um, that an attacker could get on a home network and then sort of be able to, to pivot to um, more of like a work 
work network and, and kind of get into that um, that environment that that is like separate from the house. Um, I mean, as we've seen historically, you know, there are like IoT devices that can be used um, to create botnets, right? And, um, you know, send traffic in, in one direction and take down large swaths of the internet. Um, there's always a risk, of course. Um, it's always important, you know, to do your research, make sure that you're getting the, like the most secure systems as possible, like change default passwords, things like that. Um, and so always, you know, be sort of vigilant uh, when you're connecting your home to the internet. So I know you said that you, uh, on your Twitter bio now, it says you're fighting FUD, the fear, uncertainty, and doubt, of course. So I often think that um, we're we're not scared of the things we should be scared of. Like, that's the big problem. Like, you know, oh, Facebook is definitely listening to me through my phone <laughs> is what everyone says, you know? And of course they're not, but they are like tracking you in all these different ways. So as as normal people, what what do what should we be afraid of in terms of this malware that can kill and what <laughs> should we not need to worry about? So, you know, I would say that there are really smart people that are working on this. So you can just, you know, <laughs> not worry too much about it. Like, don't panic. Um, you know, one of the things that um, our CEO, Rob Lee, likes to say is the threats are worse than we realize, but not as bad as we imagine. And kind of going back to that imaginary scenario of the hacker who totally blacks out the United States. Like, that is not a realistic scenario. The thing is, is like industrial infrastructure is extremely defensible. Um, attacks are really difficult to execute and scale. Uh, for instance, regards to Trisis, um, the malware malfunctioned and there was no loss of life. Um, so, so that's one thing to keep in mind, right? Is, is this is like these these systems are ext extremely well defended. Um, you have really smart people working on this this stuff, and it's not that. People have been thinking about this forever, right? Like while it's in the media now as like, oh, hacker blackouts, um, this is something, you know, that, that a lot of people have been working on preventing and protecting for a really long time. Um, I, I would say, you know, um, one thing to note that uh, IT and OT, which is like information technology and operational technology, that's like often segmented. So even if a hacker gets on um, the business side of an ICS environment, um, it doesn't mean it's going to get to the operations side. So like, for example, like in an oil and gas company, if um, a hacker gets on a computer that's involved in like business administration or something or like HR uh, and they like steal credentials and, and, you know, like do reconnaissance there, that doesn't mean that the oil is going to stop flowing or the gas is going to stop flowing. Like that is, those are like two different things. And I think that, you know, that's, that's important to think about as well. So how accurate is Mr. Robot? <laughs> Um, well, I know that they actually hire like people, like legitimate hackers to, to do these, to, to, to take out, to, to like execute the hacks before they do them. But I have to admit, I don't, I haven't seen a, an ICS Mr. Robot episode. I think I stopped watching it like after season one. <laughs> Me too. I did. I stopped watching. It wasn't as good after season one. So um, <laughs> we're, I think we can be forgiven. So, you know, we, you just have to write a better Mr. Robot. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Mrs. Robot. <laughs> Just kidding. I really think actually it's not a bad idea. Let's, let's change things up, Megan. <laughs> Selena, thank you so much. I, I like your pivot. This is fascinating. Thank you so much for talking to me. And um, uh, yeah, thank you for saving the world. We all appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Anytime. Um, if you have, like I said, you know, like cool, weird ICS stories, feel free, you know, call me up. We can, we can chat about them. I would love to. Uh, Selena can be found at Selena Larson on Twitter and uh, the cybersecurity company is called Dragos. It can be found at dragos.com. Thanks so much for taking some time with us. Yeah. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Take care. Craig Smith from the New York Times says that researchers have shown that they can remotely command our home's digital assistance with messages that can't be heard by human ears. Some more FUD for you. Researchers at Berkeley uh, demonstrated the ability to embed hidden commands within, within songs played by Siri, Alexa, or Google Assistant. These commands can then carry out certain tasks, you know, like you used to be able to when you played the Beatles record backwards. I think it was the Beatles record. Am I getting that right? It's one of the records you played backwards and commands would be sent out into you, to your room. Uh, Burke says it's Led Zeppelin. I don't know. I think it was all of them. But uh, these commands can dial phone numbers, open web pages, maybe even worse. Now, this is news isn't necessarily new. We talked about it uh, about a year ago, um, maybe less, where researchers from Princeton University and Zhishang University in China showed off the dolphin attack, which showed their ability to make assistance emit commands that we couldn't hear, but that our devices could. So basically, we're doomed.
Tech News Weekly records live every Thursday at 2.30 p.m. Pacific. You can be part of the show by emailing us at tnw at twit.tv. And you can subscribe to our show at twit.tv slash tnw. And if you want to tell me all the ways that we are not, in fact, doomed, I'm at Megan Maroney on Twitter. Jason Howell will be back next week. Thanks to Josh and John and Burke and everyone else who helps with our show. Thanks especially to you for joining us for Tech News Weekly.